General Marshall, United States Ambassador, arrives in Nanking to lend his efforts to the mediation of China's domestic strife. Welcomed by Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, he met with representatives of the national government and the communists. America's great wartime army chief of staff, here with the Generalissimo and Madame Chiang Kai-shek, succeeded in arranging an armistice between the warring factions. Over China's mountains, almost impassable on the ground, fly planes of the United States 10th Air Force. The Great Wall of China passes below the huge transports, now employed in the fast movement of troops. Chinese armies are being redeployed by air in former Japanese-held areas. Their job is to round up Japanese stragglers and restore Chinese administration. The plane sat down on an airfield once used by the Japanese. Aboard one of the transports are General Hagenberger, 10th Air Force commander, and General Tang and Po of the Chinese Army. Men of the 94th Chinese Army leave the transport plane. American pilots rest while their planes are refueled. Chinese civilians work to service the huge transports, which fly on a daily schedule. With the conclusion of the armistice, the world looks to a united and prosperous China. Sinbad the sailor is home from the wars. New York gives a gala reception to this United States Navy dog whose fame has been celebrated in a book. In eight years at sea, aboard the Coast Guard Cutter Campbell, this little mascot has traveled a million miles and fought in five engagements with the enemy. His collar loaded down with campaign ribbons and citations, he earns the Admiral's admiration. He gets a physical checkup before re-enlisting. He's in perfect health so he's going back to sea again. From Greenland to Tokyo, there's no sailor like Sinbad. <laughs> Hovering over a factory smokestack in a demonstration of air control is the Army's R-5 helicopter. This flying pinwheel was built by Igor Sikorsky and has broken five world records. Speeding at 115 miles an hour and rising 21,000 feet into the air, the helicopter nearly doubles the former records made by German machines. The Sikorsky R-5 was the only helicopter to see service during the war. Hovering gently, the helicopter shows how it served in war and can serve in peace. A passenger is unloaded. The machine demonstrates extraordinary lifting power, taking 17 passengers, a cargo of over 2,500 pounds, into the air. For rescue work, there is nothing better. The American helicopter is assured a busy place in the future of aviation. Back to the United States comes an old and honored friend. Former Prime Minister Winston Churchill disembarked from the Queen Elizabeth with Mrs. Churchill. They planned to spend several weeks in the United States. Following a Florida vacation, the 71-year-old statesman will visit President Truman. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is always a great uh, joy to me to land in the United States. And I thank you most uh, sincerely for the extraordinary care and consideration with which you have arranged this purely private reception. <laughs> 
soldiers' supplies go up in smoke as fire strikes a United States Army warehouse in Yokohama. Starting in an adjacent building, the fire, apparently caused by defective electric wiring, was out of control in 10 minutes. Japanese and United States Army firemen could do little but prevent the further spread of the flames. The spectators are sorrowful Army of Occupation troops whose service pay is of little use in war-depleted Japanese stores and who must depend on supplies from America for small comfort. Watches, fountain pens, cigarettes, pipes, and other supplies are lost in a smoldering mass of smoking debris. Arriving in the United States to choose a United Nations organization headquarters, a committee of delegates is met by New York City officials. They must select a site in the vicinity of either New York or Boston. The committee called on President Truman at the White House before setting about their work. From Washington, the committee proceeds to Hyde Park, New York. They inspect several locations before proceeding to the ancestral home of the late President Roosevelt. Hyde Park has been prominently mentioned as a site for the United Nations permanent headquarters. At the Roosevelt Estate, the committee is shown around the home where the late president passed much of his time and entertained world rulers and statesmen during his term of office. The world organization was one of his most cherished ideals. The seven delegates pay solemn tribute at the grave of Franklin Roosevelt. pays tribute to the American foot soldier as the 82nd Airborne Division, led by its youthful commander, Major General Gavin, marches up Fifth Avenue. These men were chosen to represent all the 10 million soldiers of the United States Army. It is New York's first big parade since General Pershing led his victorious troops along the same route in 1919. Gliders fly overhead as the city roars its welcome home to the 13,000 veterans who fought from Sicily and Italy through Normandy, Holland, and Germany. <laughs> Mechanized equipment, tanks, mobile guns, and jeeps add color to the parade. million New Yorkers lined the four-and-a-half-mile parade route to greet the men. Cardinal-designate Spellman watches from St. Patrick's Cathedral, and wounded comrades of the marching veterans add their cheers. Gavin takes his place in the reviewing stand with national, state, and city figures to salute the men who helped bring victory and peace. <laughs> 